just to reconcile sinners back to God. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already, because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Jesus Christ was manifested in the flesh to destroy the works of the devil. The Bible says Jesus died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. This man named Jesus was born of a virgin for the sinless, perfect life, performed miracles and signs and wonders attesting to who he was in the flesh. He laid down his life into the hands of lawless men who beat him and bruised him and crucified him. He was dead, he was buried, and then he rose from the grave on the third day, defeating death. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father and commands all men everywhere to repent because there's coming a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to return, friends. Are you ready? Are you prepared to stand before God to give an account of every thought? word and deed. The Bible says, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Jesus said about this about himself. The Son of Man will part the sky. He will send out his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's Jesus Christ, he's king of kings, he's lord of lords. God bless you, my brother. Oh, God bless you too. He's king of kings, he's lord of lords. And he commands all men everywhere to repent because there's coming a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. That's the Lord Jesus. The Bible says the Father has given him the name above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus said this about himself. He said, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his works. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. What Jesus Christ said about himself. He also said about himself, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by Jesus. He's the only way to the Father. The only way to receive forgiveness of sins. The only way to have your life transformed from the inside out is by this man named Jesus who died for you on the cross and rose from the grave. The Bible says he was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes you can be healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon Jesus the iniquity of us all. He's the only way, friends. The Bible says there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The name of Jesus. Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords. Is he your Lord and your Savior? Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Have you surrendered to him? I'm not talking about just praying a sinner's prayer one time or asking Jesus Christ into your heart or even getting baptized or going to church. I'm talking about have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? Jesus said, you must be born again or you cannot see the kingdom of God. That's not an optional thing. Jesus said you must be born again or you could not see the kingdom of God. That's not about a certain denomination, a certain church, a certain religion. Those are the words of Jesus Christ. 
you must be born again. And being born again doesn't mean you got baptized, doesn't mean you got confirmed to some church, or became a church member. Being born again means you've forsaken your sins, you've turned in faith, childlike, humble faith to Jesus Christ, and given your life to him, surrendered all to him by faith. If you'll do that, the Bible says you'll become born again. He'll change you from the inside out. He'll make you a new creature in Christ. Whereas 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, For anyone who is in Christ is a new creature. All the old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. I'm the, a preacher. The glorious experience of being born again, I experienced it 25 years ago. Before that, I was a fornicator, a liar, a thief, a drunkard potty mouth but in a moment of time Jesus Christ changed me from the inside out he delivered me from my sins and made me new the Bible says do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God do not be deceived the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor homosexuals nor sodomites nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And then it goes on to say this about Christians, and such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Jesus Christ died for you. Yes, he, did. he died for you. Are you living for him? Yes, sir. Jesus said, if you love me, lots of people claim to love Jesus. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. But Jesus said, those are the words of Jesus. Jesus said, you are my friend. Many claim to be Jesus' friend. He said, you are my friend if you do whatever I command you to do. Is your life submitted to Jesus in that way? That you'll do whatever he tells you to do? You know, in John 14, 21, it says, this is the words of Jesus again. He who has my commandments and keeps them. It is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. That's the words of Jesus Christ. Are you the friend of Jesus? Do you have salvation in his name? It's the only name you can find salvation in. It's by having a childlike, humble faith. This man named Jesus. It sounds kind of funny that he... To be saved, you have to have faith in this Jewish man who died 2,000 years ago on a Roman cross. But that's the way the Father has set things up. Because he, he, wants, he wants the humble. He only received those who are humble. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. So he requires faith. And when, when children were brought to Jesus, the disciples tried to wish him away. But he said, no, don't, don't stop them from coming to me. Of such is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Unless you humble yourself and become like a little child, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You'll by no means. So you've got to become like a little child to enter the kingdom of God. You've got to have that childlike faith, that childlike trust, that childlike vulnerability to give your life to this Jewish man who died for you 2,000 years ago on a Roman cross. His blood was shed for you. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. It's only by the shed blood of Jesus that you have any hope for salvation. It's only by the shed blood of Jesus that you have any hope for forgiveness from God. We've all sinned against God, friends. We've all broken God's law in many ways, hundreds, thousands of times in our life. We've broken God's law by lying or stealing or covetousness or lust our sexual immorality, drunkenness, filthy words come out of our mouth, taking God's name in vain. These are all sins in God's eyes, and we've all done them before. We've all broken God's law many, many times. The question is, how do you receive a pardon? How do you receive the acquittal you need? Because God is good and just, and he's going to punish sinners. He's going to punish sin. And God has provided the way out, the way for you to not only be forgiven and pardoned, but for you to be transformed from the inside out, and that's through this man named Jesus who died for you on the cross. Now, many people know about Jesus. They know his story. They've Maybe you grew up in church and you heard about it. Maybe your grandparents or parents told you about it. 
but has it been applied to your life? You can't just let Jesus Christ sit on the shelf and forget about him and be apathetic towards him, ignore him. What Jesus did for you requires a response. And the only proper response is such love that he showed you at the cross is to respond back in obedience to him, surrendering your life to him. The same way he gave his life for you, you turn around and give your life back to him. The Bible says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. You know, when people walk by and mock and scoff and cuss at me because I'm preaching God's word, I liken it to me being in the Coast Guard, throwing them a life preserver while they're drowning, and they cuss me out because of it. Amen. So God is offering you eternal life. He's offering you salvation. I'm simply a messenger bringing the message of the gospel. It's good news to sinners. The best news a sinner will ever hear that they can be saved. They can be changed. They can be delivered by the Lord Jesus Christ who died for them on the cross. That's the best news you'll ever hear. You, even if you don't consider it to be good news right now, Amen. someday you'll understand it even better. The Bible says uh, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved is the power of God unto salvation. See, I understand that it seems foolish to forsake the pleasure you get from your sin. You like it, you enjoy it, and to turn to Jesus by faith, it seems foolish to do those things. But it's really, God has set it up that way for a reason, because he requires faith. It requires childlike, humble faith. And the Bible says that we're saved by grace through faith. And the Bible also says that God opposes the proud. He's against, he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. See, so it requires humility to receive the grace of God, which is the only way you could possibly be saved is by the grace of God. Because listen, you, you, we've all broken God's law, right? We all have sinned against God. And no amount of good deeds you do, no amount of repenting is going to change you or help you if you don't give your life to Jesus. He's the very foundation and very grounds of salvation is Jesus Christ dying for you on the cross. You must apply it to your life. You've got to receive him. As many as those who received him, to them he gave their right to become children of God. And so receiving Jesus is as simple as you turning away from your sins, turning towards him by faith, crying out to him in prayer for mercy. And the Bible says that God is good, God is righteous. He's a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. One who relents from doing harm. That's from the book of Jonah. And Jonah was a prophet, a Jewish prophet who preached to Nineveh, this wicked city. And he didn't even like them, but he preached the truth to them, and they got saved. They repented in sackcloth and ashes, extreme repentance, and God saw them and gave them his grace, gave them his mercy, because they repented and humbled themselves and cried out to him for mercy. That's the same God that's still around today. God hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is not a man that he should lie. God changes not. And so the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, manifested in the flesh. He gives us a perfect image of the Father. So when we look at the life of Jesus in the New Testament, we see exactly what the Father is like. He said to his own disciples, you, when you see me, you see the Father. How can you say, show me the Father? So Jesus is the perfect image of the Father. And Jesus preached the truth. He performed miracles. He, he gave sight to the blind. He raised the dead. He, he healed the sick. He cleansed the leper. Gave the deaf person ears to hear. Gave the blind person eyes to see. This is what Jesus did. And Jesus hasn't changed. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father waiting for the time for his return. But that same Jesus is still doing miracles today. And the greatest miracle Jesus does is not uh, parting the Red Sea. It's not giving sight to the blind. It's taking a sinner and changing them around and making them holy 
That's the greatest miracle that God does. And he's still doing that today. Did it for me 25 years ago. My life has been changed. It's been different ever since then. I'm a new creature. Anyone who knew me before I became a follower of Jesus 25 years ago and knows me now, they know how different I am, how changed I am for the glory of God. For the glory of God. Don't let pride get in the way of you coming to Jesus and being saved. The Bible says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Don't let pride stop you from coming to Jesus Christ. Listen, we all need Jesus Christ, all of us. Even those of us who have been saved for a long time, we still need Jesus. I can do all things through him, through Christ who strengthens me. And this same Jesus that died for me, that saved me, that changed me, that still gives me strength to this day to live for him and obey him, it's the same Jesus who's still around today. He cares about you. He loves you. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to have eternal life. He wants you to know him and be known by him. In fact, that is eternal life according to Jesus Christ. Eternal life according to Jesus in John 17, 3. Not simply going to a place called heaven someday. Eternal life according to Jesus Christ is knowing God the Father and the one he has sent. That's Jesus. So eternal life is having a relationship with the Father Amen. and with Jesus. If you don't have a relationship with the Father and Jesus, I'm talking about going to a building on Sundays. I'm talking about having a relationship with Jesus where you talk to him daily. He talks to you. You read his word. You obey his commands. That's what it's like to know Jesus. In fact, the Bible says, now by this, we know that we know Jesus. See, lots of people claim to know Jesus, but do they really know Jesus? There's a test in the scripture. It's found in 1 John 2. 3 through 4. 1 John chapter 2 verses 3 through 4 says this, now by this we know that we know Jesus if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Don't let that be you. Don't let that be you. There's so many people who claim to know Jesus, claim to have the, him as their personal Lord and Savior but they're not actually obeying him. They actually have a relationship with him where they know him and speak to him. That's the Jesus that exists. He wants a relationship with those who claim to follow him. And the fact is, if you claim to follow Jesus Christ, but you're not doing the things he commands, not doing the things he did, how could you really be following him? Many people who claim to be Christians claim to sin every single day. They claim to act as if sin is impossible to overcome. Well, Jesus Christ, he's the one who overcame even death. I mean, who do you know who is risen from the grave after being dead for three days? Only Jesus Christ has done that. And if Jesus Christ can conquer death and rise from the grave after being dead for three days, surely he can overcome something as small as sin. Something as small as lying instead of telling the truth. Something as small as lust instead of being pure. Something as small as covetousness instead of being uh, content. Jesus Christ gives the power to overcome all sin. In fact, the same power that rose him from the grave, God makes available to you and offers it to you if you'll turn to him. If you'll cry out to him. The Bible says, submit yourselves to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. The Bible says, no temptation has overtaken us except such as is common to man. And God is faithful. Amen. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. The Bible says, if we walk according to the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What the Bible teaches about the Christian, normal Christian life. The normal Christian life is not defeat and continual perpetual sin. The normal Christian life is victory, walking in the spirit and doing all things through Christ who strengthens you. Amen. You know, being a Christian is not going to a building on Sundays and doing whatever you want the rest of the week. Not the Christian life. The Bible never describes a Christian life that way. Now, every Christian should be a part of a local church, no doubt about it. But that's not the, the end of it. 
going to a building for a couple hours every week. It's not the end of your, your walk with Jesus. You should go way beyond that. You see, Jesus Christ isn't an additive to your life. He should be the whole thing. He should be the main thing. He should have priority and preeminence in your life, the Lord Jesus Christ. If he's really the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, it should, it should show in your life. It shouldn't just be this little thing you go to every once in a while when you need him. Jesus Christ is not some genie in the bottle. Jesus Christ is the King of the universe. And the Bible says the Father has committed all judgment unto him. And he's given him the name above every name. Every name. The greatest name ever. Jesus. King of kings. You know his name means salvation? His name Yeshua in Hebrew, it literally means salvation. He's your salvation. But you got to repent. You got to turn to him by childlike, humble faith. Give him your whole life. Surrender all to him. Allow him to transform you from the inside out. That's what it takes to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You got to surrender all to him. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. To the mercy of God, the abundant pardon of God is available to those who will seek him forsake their sins and turn to him by faith that's the only option you have nothing else will work going to church on sunday is not going to save you necessarily helping the the poor is not going to save you giving money away is not going to save you necessarily giving your 10 percent tithe at church is not going to save you necessarily you've got to really live for jesus you got to really surrender all to him and the Bible says this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And this testify I'm giving you tonight, I'm giving you a testify testimony tonight as you make your way to the Braves game to watch them play the Mets, giving you a little bit of Bible study, a little bit of the Word of God, it's a seed that's sown in your heart. The prayer brings forth the fruit of righteousness in your life. And you let it take root in your heart. As I, as I throw forth the seed of the Word of God tonight into your hearts, I can't determine the state of the soil of your heart. Some people have a soil in their heart that's hard. Some people have rocky soil or thorny soil. Some have good soil. And I pray that you have good soil. You'll be humble, that you receive the word of God with humility and meekness, that it might bring forth a tree of righteousness in your heart. You know, Jesus Christ said in Matthew 7, verse 13, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way, which leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, but narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way, which leads to life. And there are few who find it. You're, you're going to go through a gate tonight. As you go into the stadium, you'll go through a gate, probably a turnstile type of gate. They'll be taking your tickets. Someday, you're going to have to go through a gate. The question is, will you be allowed in? And Jesus is saying today, Matthew 7, 13, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way, which leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. But narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are a few who find it. So contrary to popular opinion, there's very few who will enter into life and many who will enter into destruction, according to Jesus' own words. But Jesus says, come to me. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Those are the words of Jesus. That's the offer of Jesus. He tells you to come to him. 
but you got to come in humility. You got to come with the right heart set, the right mindset. You got to come with a humble heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. He will not receive you if you're prideful. The Bible says God hates a, a prideful look, even a prideful look. God doesn't like that. But the Bible says, the words of Jesus, if you want to come after me, you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses life for my sake and the gospels, Jesus said, shall save it. And what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul in the end? And what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And Jesus said this, if you are ashamed of me and my words, this adulterous and sinful generation of you, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Jesus said, there's, a, there's actually a cost to count. You need to count the cost when you come to Jesus. Not some flippant thing you do where you just pray a prayer for somebody or get baptized in some water, become a member of church. Following Jesus Christ is so much more than that. And some of you have had experiences with people who claim to be Christians but are hypocrites. And you need to understand, when people do that, they're not representing Jesus Christ properly. When someone lives in a hypocritical lifestyle, that's not representing Jesus Christ, because he was holy. Jesus never even lied. The seat was not even found in Jesus' mouth. He's the, the true and living God. And so he's holy. He never sinned once. He's the perfect, sinless sacrifice. The Lamb of God has come to take away the sins of this world. That's who Jesus Christ is. So if someone's going to represent Jesus properly, they must be living a holy life, an obedient life, a blameless life, uh, a life not to be ashamed of, a life without reproach. That's the life of the Christian. That's the life of Jesus. The Bible says about Christians, whoever has this hope in Jesus purifies himself even as he is pure. And 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, it says... Little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. You know, all of us want assurance in life, assurance our job's going to be there tomorrow, assurance we're going to have money in a bank account, assurance our, our car is going to keep on going, we'll have a, a severe problem. We all want assurance in life, but the greatest assurance we all need is the assurance of salvation. The assurance of eternal life. And the Bible offers that assurance. It's found, once again, found in 1 John 3, 18. Little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. So if you want assurance that you're of God, you're of the truth, your life must be lived out, not just spoken about, but lived out. And if you speak about the life, but you don't live the life, then you're just a hypocrite. Don't be that. Don't be a hypocrite. You can rise up above the temptation, rise up above the sin in the name of Jesus, and conquer and be more than conquerors in Jesus' name. The Bible says, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, Jesus said. For it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And what we have in these verses is the epitome, the, the essence of what repentance is. Cutting off the sin. Getting rid of it. Do whatever it takes to get it out of your life. And the Bible says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. But the Bible says. So repentance, repentance is not just saying you're sorry and continuing in sin. Repentance is really feeling sorry and turning from it, forsaking it, and wanting nothing to do with it any longer. Making no provision for the flesh in the future. That's what real repentance is. The Bible says, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So there is a, there is a fake 
quote unquote godly sorrow where people will cry about the consequences of their choices, cry about what they have to go through because of their sin. But true godly sorrow forsakes sin. It rejects sin. It does what Jesus said in John 5, 14 and John 8, 8, 11. Go and sin no more. But Jesus calls you to do, friends. And no one makes you put a bottle, beer bottle to your mouth to get drunk. No one makes you tell a lie instead of being honest. No one makes you be covetous instead of being content. No one makes you lust after people. No one makes filthy words come out of your mouth. These are all sins in God's eyes that you be called to give an account of on Judgment Day. As Jesus Christ is going to return, his reward is with him to give to everyone according to his works. But let's face it, friends. We may, some of us may be here when Jesus returns. Most of us probably won't. Most of us will probably be dead before Jesus comes, comes back. And so our, our primary concern is not the return of Jesus, but the frailty of life. Just think about how fragile life is. Have you ever stopped for a second and read the obituaries? Have you ever considered your life, what your life, what your life consisted? If people were to put a, a sentence on your tombstone to describe your life, what would it be? What would they say? You know, the Bible says, see then that you walk carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. King David said this in Psalm 39, Lord, teach me to number my days, that I may see how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as hand breaths. My age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but vapor. Yes, yeah, so our life is a vapor. We have this nice cool breeze today. We've got the clouds keeping the sun away for a little bit. This nice cool breeze as the breeze blows by, you understand? Your life is here. It's gone tomorrow. We don't know when our life's going to come to an end. The question becomes, what will become of you on the other side? Because you're all going to spend eternity somewhere. Where will you spend eternity? The only way to salvation, the only way to forgiveness of sins, the pardon of sins is through the man, Jesus Christ, who died for you and rose again from the grave on the third day. He's the only one. He's the greatest victor. He's never lost. The Braves will lose. The Mets will lose. Never know who's going to win this year, but the fact is Jesus always wins. If you side with him, you'll always be victorious. If you side against him and you refuse his lordship in your life, you refuse to take his side, the Lord Jesus Christ's side, you're going to lose in the end. You really are. He's the only winner there is, the greatest winner there is. When it comes to eternity, when it comes to eternal life, it's just Jesus Christ. The devil's a loser. Sin is a losing game to play. Righteousness is the only way to win. Righteousness, godliness, holiness is the only way to win. Is that the way you're living? Is that the way you're living today? You're living a righteous life? Are you obeying God? Did you open the Bible today and read it for yourself? Are you getting in the Word of God? Are you spending private time in prayer with the Lord Jesus Christ? That what you're doing with you. how, how are you spending your time today? If you all only have 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no one can increase their day by even a minute. We all only have 24 hours a day. So what are you doing with your life? Living. Living for Jesus or living for yourself? Well, it can't be a double-minded man. Double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. Can't be lukewarm. Just spews a lukewarm out of his mouth. You gotta be living for Jesus. It's all or nothing. Amen. All or nothing. You gotta give him your all. You gotta live for Jesus Christ. And you know, Jesus said this in Matthew 6. He said, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, 
and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and earthly riches, earthly, earthly treasures. Okay, so if, if, we, if we're going to spend our time the best we possibly can, it's going to be spent for the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible even says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink, do all for the glory of God. Wow, even eating and drinking for the glory of God? Yes, that's the way it should be. And so Jesus Christ wants your all. He doesn't want a partial you, a half of you. He wants all of you. He wants you to surrender all to him. And I'm here to tell you, friends, I've been, I've been living for Jesus for 25 years now. He'll do things with your life. He'll bless you in ways you can never imagine. But if you continue to live in sin, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. The Bible says you will reap what you sow. If you sow to please the flesh, you'll reap corruption, destruction, perversion in the end. But if you sow to please the spirit, you'll reap everlasting life. Sowing and reaping, what the Bible calls it. No such thing as karma in God's eyes, but there's sowing and reaping. Are you sowing to the spirit today or are you sowing to the flesh? Don't sow to the flesh, you'll reap destruction. Sow to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and reap everlasting life. The Bible says in Romans 8, 13, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. See, many people claim to be sons of God. Many people claim to be Christians. But the proof's in the pudding. If you're led by the Spirit of God, then you are a son or daughter of God. But if you live according to the flesh, the Bible says you will die. I'm not talking about physical death now. It's talking about spiritual death, being separated from God for all eternity because of your sin. You don't want that to happen to you. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, it talks about the return of Jesus as he will return with his mighty angels and flaming fire, taking vengeance on all those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These he shall punish with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. See, the return of Jesus is only pleasant for those who know Jesus who love him, who obey him, who follow him, who surrendered all to him by faith. The return of Jesus Christ, only a pleasant day for those people. The Bible says about Christians that death has lost its sting. When you think about death, it doesn't feel like something that's lost its sting. It feels like something that's, that's kind of stinging. People you leave behind, the crying, the weeping, the mourning. Death usually brings about those things. But for the follower of Jesus, it says death has lost its sting. It doesn't, doesn't bother. It's a fearful thing to die for most people, but not for Christians. It's not a fearful thing. Because we know who has the power of life and death. We know the one who has conquered death by his own power. And that's the one who we follow. See, the only way to truly have no fear over death is to follow the one who's already been there and conquered it. His name is Jesus. He's been there. He's done it. He's conquered it. So if you want to conquer death, you need to live for Jesus. You need to follow Jesus and live for Jesus. For he's the one who died and rose again. No one else can say that. No one else can say they died and rose from the grave except for Jesus Christ. Now, when Jesus was still around on, on the flesh on earth, there's a man named Lazarus who he rose from the grave after being dead for four days. And he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall never die. And so he rose Lazarus from the day, dead four days later. He ended up dying again eventually. So right now, Lazarus is, is waiting to rise from the grave for the final time. 
But Jesus Christ rose from the grave. He defeated death. He's at the right hand of the Father right now, awaiting his time to return. And he will judge the world in righteousness. If God took your life right now and judged you according to the standard of the word of God, what would become of you? It's a sobering question to ask yourself. What would become of you? Are you ready? Are you prepared to stand before God? To give an account? Very thought word indeed. He expects you to be holy. He expects you to be righteous. But the Bible teaches. The Bible says, he who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Yes, Jesus Christ came in the flesh, not to just die or live a perfect life, but to rise from the grave and to, de to destroy the works of the devil in your life. And what are those works? Sin. Sin. God wants to destroy the sin in your life so that you yourself won't be destroyed. For sin leads to destruction. The wages of sin is death that leads to destruction. That's where sin leads. That can lead you to Jesus instead if you'll humble yourself. If you'll humble yourself and repent, sin can lead you to Jesus. Sin can lead you to the Savior. Instead of leading you, leading you to destruction, sin can lead you to the Savior. The Savior from sin. See, Jesus Christ doesn't just save you from the penalty or the consequences of your sin. He saves you from the committing of sin, too. He'll make you holy and pure and righteous. What the Bible says he can do. In John chapter 8, Jesus talks about this very thing. He that commits sin is a slave to sin. A slave will not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus, you should know the truth, and the truth will make you free. He said, I am the truth. But Jesus said, the Bible says in Colossians that all the treasure of wisdom and knowledge is found in Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the truth. All the treasure of wisdom and knowledge is found in him. The truth can set you free. The Son can set you free from sin and make you whole, make you righteous. That is the whole point of Jesus dying on the cross, that you might become like him. The point of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is not that you would stay the same old sinner. The point is that you would be changed and transformed to being righteous and holy and obedient to him. That's the kind of power God has. Power to overcome sin. I know many times when people are involved in a certain sin, it seems like it's impossible to overcome it. It seems like they're entrapped, enslaved to it. But the Bible says that Jesus Christ can overcome sin. John the Baptist, the greatest man born among women, according to Jesus, said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He wants to take away your sin. Not just the penalty of it, not just the consequences of it, not just the guilt and shame of it, but actually the sin itself. He wants to make you holy. He wants to make you righteous. He wants to make you what you could not be on your own. It's amazing. I've seen lives transformed through the years of people who are just so wicked and so astray from God. In a moment of time, they give their life to Jesus and forsake their sins to become a different person. God can do the same thing for you. Don't ever think you're too far gone for God. The Bible says where sin abounded, where sin was a lot, the grace of God abounded more. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So the grace of God can overcome all sin. It can give you victory over all sin. It can forgive you of all sin. No matter how great the sin is, no matter how big the sin is, no matter how much the sin is, the name of Jesus is more powerful to give you victory over that sin. That's what God offers you. The question is, do you really want it? Do you want that victory over sin? Do you want the forgiveness of sin that Jesus Christ offers through his death, burial, and resurrection? It's a limited time offer. 
it will not be around forever. Eventually, your time will run out. Either when you die or when Jesus returns, your time will run out to get right with God. So the Bible says today is a day of salvation. If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, but rather turn and live. The Bible says God takes no delight in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn and live. The Bible says God is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's will for you. you know, God has a place called hell where he's going to put sinners. He originally made it for the devil and his angels, but it's not his desire to send anybody there. He wants all to be saved and for none to perish. He wants all to repent, all to turn and live. You might be granted life. You know, eternal life is something that only God can offer. Eternal life is something that God offers you as a gift. But even gifts must be received on certain terms. And the terms God has made is repentance and faith, humility. You must humble yourself and have faith, childlike faith, humble faith. And if you won't do that, you'll, you won't receive his grace. You won't receive his mercy. You won't receive his salvation, his eternal life, unless you receive it the way he says. But he only gives this gift to certain people. It's a precious gift. It's the most, I've received lots of gifts in my 44 years, but by far, not even close. The most precious gift to me is Jesus. The most precious gift to me is eternal life and salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins might be blotted out at times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord. So the Lord desires to give you pardon of sin, times of refreshing from his presence, but he will only give those things to those who repent of their sins and be converted. That's the only way. And what does it mean to be converted? It means to be changed. I was driving on the way here and I was reminded of this, but I saw a convertible on the highway. It went from a car with a top to a car without a top. It was converted. And God wants to convert you in a much more drastic way than that, obviously. He wants to change you from a sinner to a saint. He wants to give you a new heart and new desires and cause you to walk in his ways. That's what God wants to do for you. He wants to remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That's what he wants to do for you. I guess, we tip you? If you want to, it's up to you. I'm not here for that. Thank you. Yeah. So the Lord Jesus, he desires good for you. He has good intentions towards you. He wants the best for you. And oftentimes, uh, us as human beings, we think we know the best for us, but we don't. Because there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof leads to death. So don't don't be a know-it-all. Be humble. Open God's Word and find on the pages of a book the mind of God. What we have in the Bible, which is God's Word, we have God's thoughts on page written down by men. You want to know the truth? Open the Bible. You got to open it and read it. You got to take heed unto it and believe it. That's the only way you're going to have the wisdom of God. The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And by the fear of God, one departs from evil. God wants you to depart from evil. He wants you to have his wisdom. His wisdom is found in his word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable 
for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the word of God is for the man of God. When God gives you everything you need when it comes to wisdom and guidance and direction in life. It tells you what God is like, his character. It tells you what men are like. It tells you how God has had dealings with men in the past and how he's going to deal with men in the future. What we have in the Bible, the Word of God, is the, the mind of God upon pages. God wants you to have the truth. You need to be humble and receive the truth. The truth is found in the Word of God. There's many books in this world that you can spend time reading, that you can spend your money on. But the greatest book ever is God's book, the Bible, the Word of God. Most of you probably have one at home. Just about everybody here has a smartphone. You can access the Bible from your smartphone. There's no excuse to not read the Bible. There's no good excuse to not read the Word of God every single day. And not only read it, but believe it. Study it, obey it, share it with others. You know, when Judgment Day comes and God judges us according to the words of Scripture, and no one's going to have an excuse. It's an open book test. I mean, some of you are still in school. Imagine every test being an open book test. Imagine that. Every book being an open book test. Well, the most important test, the most vital test, the test, the test with the, the greatest implications, the greatest implication of any other test in your life is the test of judgment day. When you stand before God. And God's going to judge you according to this book. The most printed, the most purchased book in the world. The Bible. The Word of God. God will judge you by it. Are you ready for that? Have you hidden the Word of God in your heart? Are you taking heed unto the Word of God? And the Word of God is not just some dusty book to sit on your shelf and collect dust. The Word of God is living and active sharper than a double-edged sword dividing soul and spirit, bone and marrow. What the Word of God does, it convicts the hearts of men. You know, each one of you, when you were born, you had a conscience given to you by God, and the law of God is written upon your heart. Your conscience also bears witness of that. And what we have here is the Word of God agrees with that conscience. So when the Word of God is preached and it pricks your heart, you know. You know it's the truth. Don't harden your heart. Don't deceive yourself. Don't reject the Word of God. Don't reject Jesus Christ himself. Rather, surrender to him. Submit to him. There's many people in your life who haven't done you right, right? Many people in your life who, who haven't done you right. But Jesus Christ never done anyone wrong. Never. People who have betrayed your trust, who have been unfaithful to you, people who have gossiped about you and lied about you behind your back, people who betrayed you and turned away from you. But the Lord Jesus Christ, even though you've sinned against him hundreds, thousands of times, he still calls out to you. Even though you've sinned against him so many times, he still wants you to have eternal life. He still wants to know you. Even though you've, been, you've done him wrong so many times, he still wants you to have eternal life. He still wants you to be saved. That's the goodness of God. That is the mercy of God. That is the patience of God. And no one's been more patient than God with you. Right? No one's been more patient with you than God. And why is that? Because the Bible says love is patient. The Bible says God is love. Yeah, so God is patient. But even the patience of God will not last forever. God wants you to turn to him in faith. He wants, you to for, he wants you to forsake your sins today. To trust in Him. To believe upon Him. To follow Him and obey Him. That's His desire for you. That you would do those things. That you would stop turning aside from Him, rejecting Him. 
no matter what's happened to you in the past, you had some bad experiences at church or with church people, or people who call themselves Christian, maybe you had some bad experiences. But the fact is, Jesus Christ is still there. Jesus Christ still died for you. But anyone can tell you they love you. This word love is thrown around these days like it doesn't matter. Just thrown around so flippantly. I love you, I love you, I love you. But true love is proven by actions. See, love is a verb, not primarily a noun, something you possess. Love is a verb, it is an action. And the Bible says that God demonstrates his own love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Jesus acted upon his love. He didn't stay up in heaven and say, I love you. He acted upon that love and died for you. And then he rose from the grave, and he defeated death. And he commands all men everywhere to repent. That was all the loving things. To, to lay down their life, someone, someone, someone lays down their life for you, that's a loving thing. Someone dies for you, that's a loving thing. But Jesus did. And then he defeated death. And now he, he gives you his word. And he calls all men everywhere to repent. That's a loving thing too. It doesn't sound loving to some people who love their sin, who want to stay in it, but it's a loving thing to tell you the truth, that you need to repent. You need to get right with God. You need to give up your sin. It's going to cost you your soul in the end, but your sin is going to cost you your soul. And up an eternity without God. And up an eternity in hell if you don't get right with God. Bible says that Jesus Christ was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. That's Jesus Christ. That was written probably about a thousand years, a little under a thousand years before Jesus came into this world by the prophet Isaiah. A Jewish prophet wrote about the Messiah, Jesus Christ, or in Hebrew, Yeshua HaMashiach. He died for you. He suffered and bled and died for you. What are you doing with that? Are you living for him? Are you obeying him? Are you serving him? Are you sharing the gospel with others? That's what a Christian will do. If someone's truly a Christian, they'll share the gospel of Jesus Christ with other people. They won't hold it into themselves. You know, holding in salvation, the message of salvation to yourself is probably the most selfish thing anyone could ever do, right? It's the most selfish thing anybody can do is to hold the message of eternal life inside them and keep it to themselves and if you really have eternal life if you know jesus christ if you're right with god have received forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life the only proper thing to do if you are a loving person is to give that message to others to offer that same eternal life to other people and that's what i'm here to do today to offer you eternal life found in jesus christ he is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. That's Jesus Christ. He made all things. He is your creator. Whether you give him glory as that or not, he is your creator. And he calls you 
to do the proper thing if he's your creator. It's to serve him and love him and worship him. That's our duty. We are the creatures. He is the creator. And unfortunately, so many times, us creatures, instead of worshiping and serving the creator, we worship other creatures for their skills, their abilities, the crazy, fantastic things they can do as humans. Many of us will worship the people instead, the creation of God instead. In fact, Romans 1 talks about this very thing. They worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is forever blessed. Amen. But God calls you to worship him. So when you see these men out here today on the baseball field doing fantastic things, doing crazy things, things you probably couldn't even imagine doing yourself, let it well up within you worship to God. Not worship of that person, but worship of God. When you see a thunder and lightning storm, let it not say, oh, Mother Nature is so strong. Let it well up within you worship to God, the creator of all things. Next time you hear someone sing so well and so nicely, let it well up within you, not worship of that person, that'd be foolish, but worship of God the creator of all things, the creator of heaven and earth. And so when I see the different things in creation, when I see the stars in the sky that are millions of light years away, and I learn about how big they are and how powerful and mighty they are, it makes me want to worship God, not worship the stars. And so when you go out here today to this baseball field and you see these people doing these things with a baseball and a bat, throwing the ball 100 miles per hour, hitting a home run, let it cause you to worship the one who made them, not them themselves. No man is worthy of worship. No man is worthy to be worshipped. But God is always worthy to be worshipped. And when you see his creation doing things, crazy things, maybe, maybe watch some highlights of a different sport besides baseball, that should cause you to worship the one who made that person. Not that person because they have some skills and abilities that you couldn't imagine having. So we look upon creation, we look upon humans and the things they can do. The human eye, the human brain, the human heart, the function of the human body, the fact that your heart pumps blood through your body without you even thinking about it. Your lungs pump oxygen through your body without you even thinking about it. That should cause you to worship God. I mean, imagine you had to think about breathing every second or your heart pumping every second. You couldn't think of any, any, about anything else. It's all you think about. But God made you that way. He made you so your heart and lungs work involuntarily. You don't even think, don't even think about it. And that should cause you to worship Him. There's so many things in life that should cause you to worship God and give Him glory. Don't let anything take your gaze and your worship off of Him and put it upon anything else. Just never worship anyone or anything else but God, Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, the God of the Bible, the only one true and living God, the God of scriptures. Have you worshiped him today? Have you obeyed him today? Have you lived for him today? He should be your all in all. He should take preeminence and priority in your life above and before anything else. He should be the center of your thoughts. He should be the one that controls what the words are that come out of your mouth. They're not filthy words or words taking God's name in vain. So calls you to love him and obey him, even with your mouth. Now Jesus Christ, when he was on earth, he said this. So either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. He says, brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, and the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. An evil man, and of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. Then Jesus said this, But I say unto you, that for every idle word men may speak, they'll give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. So the words of your mouth matter a lot to Jesus. 
even the ones that are called idle words, the ones that come out flippantly that you're not even thinking about before you say them, those things matter to God. And with the words that come out of your mouth, reveal the state of your heart. Reveal what your heart is like. This is what Jesus Christ said. Out of the mouth comes the overflow of the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. An evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. As you go to the game tonight and you see a bad call, you don't like uh, a strike call the umpire made or a ball, don't let that filthy language come out of your mouth. It's going to reveal the state of your heart. And a good man has good treasure in his heart. A good man hides God's word in his heart that he may not sin against his Lord. So I encourage you tonight to do that. Let God order your steps, direct your steps. But you're always following him and obeying him, Jesus Christ. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already. He's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now what does it mean to believe in Jesus? Does it mean you have some kind of intellectual agreement, some mental assent? Now to believe in Jesus is to believe what he says. To believe in Jesus is to believe what his word, the Bible says. That's what it means to believe in Jesus. You can't separate Jesus Christ from the things he said. So Jesus Christ, to believe in him truly and to therefore have eternal life is to trust in him, to, to give your whole life to him and surrender to him, to trust him with your whole life. That's what it means truly to believe in Jesus. So have you done that, friends? Have you begun to believe in Jesus? And if you have begun, are you still believing Jesus and doing what he says? and obeying him and loving him and serving him. That's what he calls you to. That's what he calls you to. He calls you to love him and obey him and serve him. We think about the faithfulness of God. There's an old song that talks about great is his faithfulness. His faithfulness is so great. I'm here to tell you in the last 25 years, to my own shame, I have sinned many times. And God has always been faithful to me to correct me, to rebuke me, to chastise me when I've sinned against him. He's always given me, been patient with me and given me opportunity to repent. And he wants to give you the same opportunity to repent, to forsake your sins. What does it mean to repent? Well, in very practical terms, it means if you're a liar, you stop being a liar and you tell the truth. If you're a drunkard, you stop getting drunk and you be sober. That's what it means to repent. If you have a filthy mouth that cuss words come out of and taking God's name in vain comes out of it, you repent of that and allow good words to come out of your mouth. If you're an idolater of men, you <laughs> repent and worship and serve the one true and living God only. If you're a sexually immoral person, Repentance means you stop that and you be pure. That's what it means to repent. That's what repentance is. What following Jesus Christ looks like.
my prayer for you tonight, friends, that you have more urgency to hear the word of God and obey it than you do to be there for the first pitch. You have more desire to be right with God than to watch the Braves game. It's my prayer for you tonight. May we turn to Jesus Christ in faith and repentance and love him and obey him. The Bible says, once again, repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins might be blotted out, that times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord. The Bible says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter return to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of God and he will lift you up. God says, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as so. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool, if you are willing and obedient. God offers you mercy. He offers you cleansing of sin, pardon of sin, if you'll repent. If you'll turn to him in repentance and faith. If you'll seek the Lord while he may be found. And call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. The abundant pardon and mercy of God is available to you today. And the, the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is way more important than any baseball game. Is that your IQ, sir? Is that what that was, your IQ? As the Lord Jesus Christ dying for you, rising from the grave, defeating death, and commanding all men everywhere to repent is way more important than any sports game, any Braves game. Check your heart. Did Jesus Christ have the preeminence in your heart? Is he sitting on the throne of your heart today? Who's sitting on the throne of your heart today? Jesus died on the cross. For you, and if you want to follow him, you have to take up your cross deny yourself and follow him that's what he said the preacher once said in your heart in every heart there's a cross and there's a throne and then in, the, in the, the the throne room of your heart jesus christ should be sitting upon the throne and you should be on the cross but for many people it's the opposite they are on the throne of their heart and jesus is still on the cross but Jesus Christ is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He does have the name above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Once you submit yourself to him today, surrender to him today, begin to follow him today, turn from your sins today, and turn your life over to Jesus Christ. Or as the Bible says, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. So many deceive themselves. They've heard the word of God over and over and over again. They've heard the gospel many times, but they refuse to repent. They refuse to surrender their life to Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that a person who hears the word of God and does not do it, it's like a person who looks in the mirror and walks away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Jesus Christ said, if you hear his word and do not do it, you're like a man who built his house upon the sand. And the winds and waves came and beat and blew against the house and it fell and great was its fall. Who here would really build a house upon sand? But your life, your house, if you hear the words of Jesus 
and refuse to do them is like a house built upon sand. But when you hear the words of Jesus and do them, Jesus Christ likens you to a house built upon the rock. And the winds and waves came and beat and blew against that house, and it stood. It's built upon the rock of hearing the words of Jesus Christ and doing them. That's when you're blessed. The Bible says, blessed is the man who does his commandments, that he might have the right to the tree of life, that he might enter in through the gates into the city. If you want to enter into the city of God, the kingdom of God in the end, the new Jerusalem, you must not only hear the word of God, but do the word of God. That's God's requirements. That's God's commandments to you. You know, we just had fireworks on July 4th. We see some more fireworks here tonight. But I'll tell you, the fireworks of Jesus Christ's return will be more spectacular than that. The fireworks of Jesus Christ's return will be way more spectacular than any fireworks show you've ever seen. He's going to park the sky. As the lightning shines from the east to the west, the Bible says, every eye will see him. The Lord Jesus Christ, every eye will see him. For the Bible says, you will see him. Even those who pierced him, and they will mourn. And some will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But many will be fearful, will be scared when Jesus returns. They will say to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know. Sweeter than Acuna Jr. Jesus Christ, King of Kings. Better than the all-star or any Hall of Famer that ever has been or will be. Jesus Christ, a greater name than Hank Aaron. Jesus Christ, he's the King of Kings. Not 755. Doesn't need any home runs. He's the King of Kings. Did Hank Aaron die for you on the cross, sir? Did Hank Aaron shed his blood for you? Does Hank Aaron offer salvation through his name and forgiveness of sins and eternal life? I guess he's got Hank Aaron beat the nothing. Which one of these men have died for you? Which one of these men have shed their blood for you? Which one of these men who don these uniforms today, whether Mets or Braves uniforms, have ever offered you eternal life in their name? See, as we, as we, I used to be a sports fan, not really anymore. I used to be a sports fanatic. And there's a, a delusion involved in being a sports fan that we think that the, these stars know us somehow or It'd be so spectacular to shake their hand or to be in their presence. That's just idolatry, friends. Let's face it. The only one whose presence we should desire to be in in that way is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one whose presence we should desire to be in that way. And, and, and the thing is, God is omnipresent. So he's always close by. It doesn't take much to be in God's presence. You know, so we, as, you, as you wear these shirts and these jerseys and these hats today, I hope your heart is where it's supposed to be, worshiping and serving God, not worshiping and serving a man or a creature, but the creator. He's the one worthy of your worship. He's, he's the one whose name should be high and lifted up, Jesus Christ. Not these, all these other men whose names you wear on your shirt. I'm not saying it's a sin to have a jersey or anything like that, but listen, our heart needs to be in the right place. Right? We should worship and serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Have you considered putting his name on your shirt? Amen. Brother. Jesus. Jesus. Name above every name. Amen. Name which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. His name isn't Freeman. His name isn't Acuna. His name isn't Hank Aaron. No, his name isn't Chipper Jones. His name is Jesus Christ. And he's done things way more famous that any baseball player could ever imagine. Because he's never sinned. He was sinless, a sinless savior who can take away the sins of the world, who can save a sinner and make them a saint and make them righteous and transform them and change them. 
That's what Jesus Christ offers. No brave, no met can offer that in the history. Jesus Christ makes an offer that no one else can offer. No man, no woman. So common sense tells us, logic tells us, we're going to give all our time and attention to him. We're going to worship him and love him and serve him and obey him. He's worthy of our time. Now, if we can sit at a baseball game for a few hours, no problem, but we can't sit before him in prayer, can't sit before him in the word and read 10 chapters, it's probably something wrong. Probably something wrong. He deserves our time and attention. He deserves our thoughts. He deserves our words that come out of our mouth. He deserves our, our time and the actions we do. Jesus Christ deserves these things more than any other man does. Any athlete, any sports team, any celebrity, musician, actor, actress. There's so many things that people worship these days, whether they actually bow down or not, their time and their attention, their money, when it goes in one direction, it shows where the state of the heart is. And the state of our heart should always be one with God, righteous, following him, serving him, and obeying him. 